Welcome everyone. Welcome back for the people that joined us for session one as well. This is session two, the afternoon of From the Ground Up Collecting in Southwest Sydney, a two-part webinar series hosted by Fairfield City Museum and Gallery. My name is Alinda Bierhauser and I am joined here today by my colleague Kellyanne Stanley, who is hidden behind the FCMG logo. Just waiting for the people to trickle in for session two. Letting you know as well that both sessions today have been recorded or are being recorded and we will share them online on our YouTube channel later this month. So you will be able to rewatch or um, watch for the first time one of the sessions that you might have missed. Session two this afternoon, um, I'll just give you a quick outline. It's going to have three speakers, but we are going to start with a quick history quiz. Just to do something fun after the lunch break, but also to give you um, some inspiration maybe on how you can do um, a history quiz yourself. We are using a platform called Cahoots, and I will take you, we'll be taking you through that soon. The chat function is also still functioning, so feel free to post any questions for our speakers there. We will be looking at them um, and relaying them for you. So Kelly, I think it's um, quiz time. Can you take us to the next slide? Great. So we're going to use a platform called Kahoot. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar, I'm going to ask you to go to a separate website. And the easiest way to do that is actually by using your mobile device, although you can do it as well on your computer. You'll just have to open a separate web browser. So either on your mobile phone, your tablet, or on your computer, go to www.kahoot.it. Kellyanne has also posted the link in the chat for you to see. And when you get to that website, you will be asked to enter a game pin. As you can see, the game pin for our quick history quiz is 985235. And I see the first person has already entered. We have space for about 50 people in our subscription. So we are operating on a first in best dressed policy today because we have been um, somewhat overwhelmed by the um, number of registrations received for the webinars today, right? I see lots of people have joined. So you will be able to give yourself a nickname and then you'll pop up on the screen for our quiz. It is gonna be a really short quiz, but it is um, a fun thing to do. We've done it with our colleagues as well during COVID. Now that we are all living online, working online, constantly in the digital space. Um, it's good to break it up sometimes. So I'll just give you another 30 seconds or so for those of you. So again, go to the website, www.kahoot.it and then enter the game pin and give yourself a nickname that will appear on the screen. The quiz, of course, um, is competitive. We will at the end see a winner on the screen. You will get points for the right answer, but also points for speed. So if you know the right answer, don't hesitate, click straight away, because you will be getting points for speed as well. And if you don't know the answer, just guess quickly, because you might be correct and still get lots of points. You will be able to see the question on the screen. I will be reading it out as well. And you will also be able to see the question on your device that you're playing on. And then you will have to tap the right answer that um, on the screen that you're playing on. So on your phone or on your tablet. I still see some names popping up. We've got about 25 people joining. For people that don't feel comfortable, you'll still be able to see the quiz questions and answers on your screen. So you can just participate without being in the competition. All right, I think um, we can go to the first slide, Kelly. So we'll just go to the beginning slide, the beginning page of the quiz.
Beautiful. So it's counting down, not to the first question yet. It's just going to be the first slide. Just to make sure that we're all in the right quiz page. And then we're going to start with question one. You'll have about 30 seconds to answer each question. What is the word for country in direct language? So you can see ticking down from 30. Is it Yana, Nura, Badu, or Yanu? And click the right answer on your device. And as soon as everyone has submitted an answer, we will go to the right answer. And otherwise it will tick down to zero seconds. So you have about five seconds left to put in your answer. And then we'll go to the... Great, most people got it correct. 10, 10 out of, I think we have 25 players currently. The answer is Nura, which does mean country in Dharak. The other words, um, I did make them up, they are words. Yana means walk. Yanu means buy, but also I go. So you can see a link there between walking and going. Um, Badu means water. Now I got these um, words from a great website, a great resource called Darak and Darwell Resources, which is a website and dictionary, um, a shared initiative by UNSW and the Centre of Indigenous Technology, Innovation and Environmental Sustainability or CITES. So definitely have a look there as well. It's a great resource. And we'll go back, uh, sorry, go forward to the next question, but not before we've seen who's leading. So MMJC is in the lead. Well done, we'll go to the next question. True or false, St. Luke's, Luke's Church in Liverpool built between 1818 and 1820 was not consecrated until 1956. Is this true or false? St. Luke's is Liverpool's oldest church, commissioned by Governor Lachlan Macquarie and designed by Francis Greenway. Anglican church that opened in 1820 but is it true or false that it wasn't consecrated until 1956, 130 years later? Two seconds. It is indeed true, boss. Maybe a bit of a leading question. Um, they forgot when it first opened, they forgot to consecrate it. It never happened. And the error wasn't discovered until 1956 when they quickly fixed it. Um, so just a reminder how important good record keeping is. Let's go and see what that did to the score. Got a new leader on the board, Tara, with a lot of points. Well done, but lots of people chasing you. So anything is still possible. Next question. Wine growers from which European country were contracted to work at the MacArthur Vineyards at Camden Park Estate? Were they Wine growers from France, Germany, Italy, or Croatia. Got about 20 seconds left, although a lot of you are already submitting answers. The MacArthur family, ran the Camden Park estate. Lots of sheep, but also vineyards. Who did they bring over there to work at the vineyards? Very tight. So we've got the right answer here, Germany. As early as the 1830s, the MacArthur family brought vignerons or vine dresses from the German Rhine region to their newly established vineyards in Camden in the New South Wales colony. They contacted them for two to five years and brought their whole families over um, and also vine cuttings. So for example, the famous Riesling grape was brought over to Australia at that time. Great, let's see who's in the lead and then we'll go to the next question. Tara, well done, you're still leading. But Moz and Glenn are not far behind. So anything again, still possible. Got a few more questions to go. Question number four, the legend of Fisher's ghost, one of Australia's best known ghost stories. Which of the following statements is false? So three are correct, pick the one that is false. Does Campbelltown host an annual festival of Fisher's Ghost? Or was the story once published by Charles Dickens? D, 
did Queen Elizabeth visit the site of the ghost sighting in 1963? Or is the creek where the ghost was sighted still named Fisher's Ghost Creek? Now, very happy that Andrew retold us the story in his presentation in session one. Ooh, this is interesting. Most of you thought that Charles Dickens did not publish the story, but in fact, he did. In 1855, in a collection of stories called Household Words, um, a version of the tale by John Lang was published. Queen Elizabeth, however, might be a fan of ghost stories. I don't know, but I made up the answer. That is not true. All right, let's see. Tara, still in the lead. You're on a streak. Well done. We'll go to the next question. In which suburb is the former PM Gough Whitlam's family home located? Is it Cabramatta, Mount Pritchard, Karama, or Settler? Um, see the fence here? It was number 32. I can even give you the street name. It was Albert Street. But where was it? Was it in Cabramatta, Mount Pritchard, Karama, or Settler? Got seven seconds, five seconds left. A few more people. Need to answer? Most of you knew that one. It has been in the news quite a lot recently. It was Cabramatta. Um, it was an architect designed showpiece that was dub dubbed ahead of its time, built in the 1950s. And Goff and Margaret Whitlam owned the property from 1956 until 1978, including throughout his prime ministership. The house has recently been placed in the custody of the Whitlam Institute, and you will hear more about this later on from one of our speakers. And we have a new leader. Well done, Andy, although Tara is still right behind you. We're going to the last and deciding question. So again, keep in mind, not just the right answer, but also speed is important. Which architect designed the heritage listed Cabramatta Library? Britt Anderson, Jorn Edson, Peter Stutchbury, or Harry Seidler. You can see a photo here of the Cabramatta Library being constructed in the 1970s. It's still the library that we use today. Some railway parade just opposite the station. Three seconds. And we'll go to the right answer. It was Harry Seidler. His architecture firm, Harry Seidler and Associates, designed the present day library building in Cabramatta, which opened in 1975 and was subsequently renamed in honor of former Prime Minister Gough Whitlam in 1982. Well done, everyone. I think a lot of people got a lot of right answers. So we'll go to the podium and see who won. Andy, number three. Moz, number two, and our winner today, Tara, you're back. That is really impressive. And we've got number five and number four as well, quickly on the screen. Now we're not playing for a prize, just eternal fame and glory for everyone who attended today. I hope you enjoyed that little um, interlude. And then I'll get Kelly to go back to the slide and we'll start with our speakers for this afternoon. So our first speaker is Glenn and Kelly will bring Glenn up as a panelist. Well, I quickly give you an introduction. So Glenn Optebrau, fellow Dutch name, is the president of the city of Liverpool and District Historical Society. And he has been the president for the last five years. He also runs their collection and curates their exhibitions in their exhibition space. The Society is a volunteer run organization with an extensive local collection of mainly photographs and objects. Now, Glenn, I can see you've joined us. We'll just need you to turn on your um, microphone and your camera. And then you'll be ready to start presenting. Hello. Hi, Glenn. Are you ready? Hi, Linda. I'm ready. <laughs> All right, take it away. Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks to Alinda and uh, thanks 
for inviting us to participate today and to remind the world that we exist and uh, to tell you what we're up to. So what I'm going to do is uh, we'll, I'll give you a brief history of uh, our society, uh, a background to our collection, how to access parts of our collection uh, from home, and how to engage with the society and how we encourage interest in history. So I've been the president of the Liverpool uh, Historical Society for about five years. I'm also the manager of our collection and curator of exhibitions amongst uh, many other duties as required. I'm also Liverpool born and bred and I'm still here. Uh, I would describe our society for the most part as being a very traditional kind of society, but with a twist, uh, we obviously need to uh, evolve uh, to ensure that we uh, survive into the future. We try and have our regular monthly meetings with a guest speaker and a tour of a historic property, such uh, in the past we've done St. Luke's Church or the local Masonic Lodge, and we like to have the very traditional afternoon teas. So uh, our history. Um, look, Liverpool may well be the fourth oldest town in Australia, but we didn't get a historical society formed until 1959. And that was to coincide with the desire to celebrate Liverpool's sesquicentenary, our 150th birthday in 1960. So hopefully we'll have a, a slide up of uh, our reenactment. There we are. That's uh, some of our members in 1960 at, at, at the reenactment of the founding of Liverpool in 1810. Uh, actually, that's my colorized version. The original was actually in, in uh, black and white. So there were 30 initial members of the society and they mostly of old uh, Liverpool colonial families. And it took a while to find our feet. Uh, eventually we found a home at the Liverpool TAFE, the Francis Greenway Hospital built in 1825. And uh, when it came to establishing a collection, there seemed to be an initial rush of enthusiasm, as there usually is in donating items to the collection. Um, and we were very much a, the rural country town back in 1960, and now Main Street, Macquarie Street, looked very much like uh, the Main Street, say, or Bathurst or Orange do today. So a lot of our initial uh, items that were um, donated were like farming type uh, objects, lots of rabbit traps, etc. Now, unfortunately, unlike many other long running established local and rural museums, uh, we've had a very unstable existence, uh, being regularly evicted from our museums. And still today, we're without a shop front home. Um, today, I call ourselves the Liverpool Museum in exile, because much of our 10,000 or so items that we have in our collection are stored away in boxes. Uh, the result, of this instability is that members would take items home to safely store them and unfortunately they were never seen again. So while we have many great items of significance to Liverpool's history, unfortunately we've lost much along the way. So it's a bit of a patchwork collection that we have um, and there are plenty of gaps. Uh, I don't think there was any strategy for accepting items for donations in the good old days. If someone had something that looked old, um, it would be greatly accepted. So my aim, since I've been president, um, is to try and plug some of those gaps. Uh, for instance, I couldn't believe that we didn't have a TV or a cassette player when I was curating an exhibition for uh, items uh, of technology that the smartphone had replaced. Um, so the collection gaps that I've been aiming at recently include school and sporting uniforms. We've had not many school or sporting uniforms at all. And when you consider the thousands that are thrown away uh, every year, this is really astonishing. So um, we've got a few uh, along the way over the last couple of years. Um, political campaign advertising. We've, I've got lots of core flutes donated by various politicians over the years from you know, local elections to New South Wales elections and federal elections. Locally made bricks. Uh, we've had some very generous donations of convict bricks that relate 
directly to Liverpool buildings that have been demolished in the past. And that's been a good acquisition. Uh, any old shop signings, I like signs because signs are easy to store and they tell a lot of, about the history of business in Liverpool. And I'd just like to mention two recent acquisitions we've had that have been particularly brilliant. And one has been the collection of the Liverpool Pipe Band, um, which disbanded back in the early 2000s. So we now have 30 or 40 uniforms um, and lots of bits and bobs of pipes and spirons, et cetera. And also a Whitlam-esque type um, collection of the former Liverpool mayor, uh, Kevin Napier. Um, and both of these collections have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of items. Um, and we also like to, our aim to, is to um, publish uh, at least one book about Liverpool history. Um, so that's been rather hard to do, but um, that's, that's been our aim. Uh, okay, look, after our last eviction from the Liverpool Museum in 1995, and I won't go there, uh, Liverpool Council eventually found a space to store our collection in what you might describe as a bunker in the car park under Liverpool Library. And uh, what you see there is part of it. It's, it's, a, it's an L shape and there's some of our volunteers there a few years ago. Um, it's not a whole heap of room, but uh, we have something like uh, 170 archive boxes, as well as a couple of filing cabinets, as you see there on the left, and some um, tables to do our work. Um, as I said, most of the items there are in archive boxes. We have some larger items stored in a small shed just outside there. And we have a container at uh, Liverpool uh, Council Depot. We use the Mosaic collection management system to catalogue our items. We started loading in 2011 and it's still work that's ongoing um, as uploading of photos in the collection. I think we're up, we're only at about, um, up to about 5%. So it's a, it's a long ongoing job. Uh, we do have some items on display at Collingwood House, Australia's fourth oldest house. We have some items on display at the Liverpool TAFE. Um, and thanks to a sympathetic Liverpool councillor, we now have a room at Liverpool Library to display some of our items while they liberate trying to find a, a real home for us. So promoting an interest in our collection. Uh, this is the uh, Havard Room, which is the our room at uh, Liverpool Library. Uh, we encourage interest in Liverpool's history with regular photo posts of our stories uh, of Liverpool via our Facebook page, as well as encouraging people to donate items to the society. We have a new arrival display, as you can see there, those prams there uh, along the window, where new donations are displayed and that's a, a carrot, I guess, for um, people who are willing donors. We have a biannual display at Westfield. Thank you, Westfield, for letting us do that. And we also sponsor a Liverpool History Art Prize um, at the annual Liverpool Art Society exhibition. And we do have also an open day once a year. And there's a um, our open day, probably the last one we had because we're not going to have one this year and we weren't able to have one last year either. So access to our collection. So being frustrated that we didn't have a shop front and we don't have a shop front still, uh, we're, and makes it really un, not easy to access the public. We first started our Facebook page in 2014 and then we developed a website in 2017. So on your left, you can see um, the homepage of our website, and it's also linked to our Facebook page. These, the stream there you see on the left is uh, would have been the current Facebook post at the time. Uh, on the right, you can see a link to some articles we had published in the local uh, papers when we did have local papers. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that access anymore either. The website is always evolving. 
Uh, but pre-empting COVID-19 exhibitions, we put up several online exhibitions in 2019 and 2020. So we were very well prepared for COVID-19. So the first one is the history of Liverpool in 60 objects, which um, we curated back in uh, 2019. Um, it was to coincide with our birthday, our 60th birthday in 2019. So we curated, that's why the, the magic number, 60. And so we created 60 items from our collection and you can uh, click on each one of those images and get more information from each one of those pictures. The next exhibition that we curated was the Eric Wilson exhibition. Now, he's, well, I regard him as Liverpool's most renowned artist, a painter from the 1930s and the 1940s. And he died tragically young at the age of only 35. So his paintings hang in galleries um, all around Australia and all around the world, in the National Portrait Gallery, Gallery the, um, the uh, New South Wales Art Gallery, Australian National Gallery, and we don't own any Eric Wilson. So I thought the best way to, um, to view Eric Wilson's work is, is to purloin all these images from the websites from all, all these galleries. And, and collect them into one, a one-stop shop for Eric Wilson. So again, if we can, um, it's possible to click on each one of those paintings. There's 30 paintings there in the collection, uh, including some images of or paintings of Liverpool. The first one you can see there is a backyard in Macquarie Street in 1932, because that's where Eric Wilson was living. Uh, next one is Liverpool Rocks. Now, Liverpool, New South Wales is uh, and never will be um, generating the same amount of uh, quality music as Liverpool in, in, uh, in England. But we did produce a lot of good bands in the 70s and 80s. So along the same lines, I've collated a, a, a few um, um, videos of that bands have posted on YouTube and we've linked them and collated them into one site called Liverpool Rock. Now, we're going to have a quick play of one of them, which is Elm Tree, a band from the late 60s and early 70s. It just happened to be the first band that John Paul Young joined. And also some of the band members ended up being in other um, local bands, such as the Lonely Hearts. So let's give this a bit of a play. Um, and along the same lines as um, collating um, videos that are Liverpool related, um, hopefully we'll go to another page called videos. I should call it um, Liverpool history videos. And again, I've collated uh, um, newsreels and film that relate to Liverpool's history. And we're going to look at one about the Kusula Wreckers uh, from about 1930-ish. Here lie the remains of the faithful steeds of 20 years ago. Once somebody's pride and joy, now they enjoy their well-earned rest alongside the road over which they so often travelled. Now look at the parade of the very latest models. So late that they've almost missed the bus. Look at that retired old gentleman on the right. I'll bet he could tell some tales if he wanted to. <laughs> oh, yes. Things were just the same in his day as they are now. Isn't she a okay. little beauty? All right. So that's um, Kasula Records. And uh, look on our 
on the on the website you can uh, also um, buy or order books and um, you can also um, fill out that application form to become a member um, you're invited to do that so yeah that's our uh, that's our website um, so moving on to our Facebook page our our Facebook page has posted hundreds of photos over the years. And while they're not searchable by name, they are certainly browsable. It's like going to a video shop in the good old days and spending ages going through a video, looking at the videos. You can browse our photos simply by clicking on the photo tab of the web of the Facebook page. Um, Facebook's proven to be a rather excellent tool in, in engaging those with an interest of Liverpool's history. We have something like three and a half thousand likers of our page. Um, and to motivate people to actually like a post is not always easy, but we're pretty successful at doing that. Um, and there's nothing more successful than um, posting something like an image of the Liverpool, the now demolished Liverpool Olympic pool of the 60s and 70s, and you can see the likes go through the roof. So there's uh, nothing like nostalgia in regards to um, a successful Facebook post. Um, moving on to some tips about uh, researching Liverpool. I spent many hours, days, weeks, months in Trove uh, researching various aspects of Liverpool's history. And um, if anyone is or has um, any intention of uh, looking at um, various um, aspects of Liverpool in, in Trove, um, my big tip is to go down to the field that says without words, without these words, and I always put in planes and street, which is Liverpool planes and the Liverpool street. So that will omit uh, any matches in regards to Liverpool planes and Liverpool street. And there are a lot of stories um, about that, that in regard to Liverpool planes or street. So that's my big tip um, in regard to researching Liverpool's history. Um, look, so that's really it for me. Um, it's really, really just the tip of the iceberg in relation to what we're doing and what we like to do. Um, so, as I said, if you're interested in Liverpool, go to the website and join today. Um, that'd be good. We're always looking for volunteers. We're always volunteer shy. Um, and uh, we always appreciate anybody that puts up their hand to do any work uh, in assisting the society. So on, also on that note, um, in the future, when it's safe to do so, please come and drop in and find us and uh, have a look around our uh, archives and also our little uh, exhibition space in Liverpool Library. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thanks, Glenn. That was great. I'll um, start off um, not with a question, but a comment from someone from the audience who says that Liverpool has such a rich and diverse history and is evolving into a big city. I'm amazed the Historical Society doesn't have dedicated space to present the collection, but great dedication to online access. So I will heartily agree, you guys do a lot. And as you said, you're all volunteers. Um, and um, that was my first question to you. Could you maybe give us some insight in but from your perspective, the big benefits, but also challenges are of being a volunteer run organization. Because we've heard today from a lot of speakers that represent um, organizations funded by local government or state government, but um, what is it like to be volunteer run and operate on minimal resources? Frightening, Ellen. <laughs> Frightening. Um, I, I call ourselves a low cost operator because that's really the best way um, to work. Um, we only have limited amount of um, members who, um, who, and you know, char we only charge twenty dollars a year to become a member. So, really, we, you know, we, it's not enough money to run this, the society. So we do rely on grants to really um, to um, have things like um, uh, websites and for new uh, archival equipment. Um, there's only so many uh, volunteers that we have to do the actual physical work. So we've got to play it smart. So yeah, being a low cost operator is really the, the way we have, we, we have to work um, and use our resources um, in the most uh, economical way. Um, I look, you know, there's, 
I, I do do a lot of work myself. Uh, I'd rather share it, um, but it's it's there's only so many people that are willing to put up their hand. But I've I've found that I've done pilgrimage tours of many uh, historical society in the country. I probably and when in New South Wales especially, I've probably visited twenty or thirty of them um, to see how um, what they do and how they do it. And everyone everyone's struggling out there as far as volunteers. Um, when when I asked them, said, oh, you know, this, this, how many members do you have? But, you know, there's so many. And how many volunteers do you have? The common number is five. <laughs> and wherever I go, everyone has five active volunteers. And that's about the same as us. And that's just the way it's going at the moment. It's just a struggle to get um, volunteers in. Look, I really don't know why. I don't know why five is the magic number. But uh, it's just a struggle that I see wherever I go. Yeah. Is there also some benefits or positives that you can think of of running a, a volunteer-run um, organisation? Oh, well, I, the benefit, I guess, is we can do what we like <laughs> in, in a lot of ways. Um, it's, up, it's up to the um, executive about how, how, in what direction we're going. Um, we obviously probably could get more done working closer with various organisations. And that's what I tried to do. I've tried to reach out to various organisations in regard to funding or help, helping us as, you know, in, I can give an example, our local um, funeral parlour, would you believe, which is a, quite a historic one. They've been going since the 1940s. So they have a history or an interest in Liverpool history. And when we look we were looking at places where we can hold meetings. They reached out and said, you can hold a meeting here whenever you want. And even though that might seem a strange place to hold a meeting because they have a rather nice chapel there, but it's a space that, um, that can accommodate about 60 people. Um, great PA, they provide the afternoon teas. So yeah, so we can, the good thing is, I guess we can run a, our, our own race. In, um, and so we have that freedom. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think there aren't any other questions from the audience, so I'm going to leave it there and move on. But thank you, thank you Linda. very much. It was great to hear from you and hear about all the amazing work that you and your five volunteers do. And I can, can I just add that um, all the speakers so far have been excellent and I've learned something from all the speakers so far. I've taken some notes and uh, I'll probably get in contact with some of them in the future. Fantastic. Thanks, Glenn. Nice to have you on board. And we'll move on to our next speaker, our second last speaker of today, Vicky Movizio. So Kelly has brought Vicky on. She's popped up on the screen. Vicky is another local studies librarian. And I'm just trying to find her bio. Vicky works for Camden. Camden Council, and here we go. So Vicky's been working as the local studies librarian at Camden Council, Camden Library for a while. Um, it is her role to collect, organize, and maintain information relating to the people, places, and events in Camden, as well as helping to preserve and share the history of the area. She curates Camden images, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, which is a collection of photographs found on the library web page. She also responds to customer inquiries and liaises and meets with the Camden Historical Society and Camden Area Family History Society. She coordinates special programs, including story time sessions, museum tours, um, and is responsible for two exhibitions held in the library and online each year. Thank you very much for joining us, Vicky, and you can start your presentation. Thanks, Alinda. Uh, I'd like to just take the opportunity to thank the team from Fairfield for inviting me today to share a little bit of the story of our local studies collection at Camden. Um, like everybody else, I'm working from home at the moment and actually live in part of Fairfield Council area. So I'm a Fairfield old girl right from the word go. Um, so it's really interesting to even hear and see of some of the um, experiences of other people working in the history field. Um, I worked at Liverpool Library for nine years almost, so um, I understand the trouble and 
the problems that you can have when you are a volunteer organisation and you don't have somewhere to be based at. Um, anyway, moving on, you can see the first photo I've got posted up here today is more or less the iconic landmark of Camden. And the reason I chose to put that photo up is that it will be familiar to most people, but it's also an ongoing link with Camden's past history and its future history. The church parishioners are very proactive at the moment. They've recently fought against having, um, I think it was a big chain of um, aged care facilities wanted to build a building in one of their paddocks. And even though there was permission for the land to be sold from the church to fund roofing or whatever, um, the actual purpose and use of the land has not only met uh, reluctance from a lot of the parishioners, but also from some of our community groups, including our Camden Action Group and our um, Historical Society. But having said that, I'd also like to draw attention to the fact that Camden is an area that is just full of history. And we are so lucky that the people in the area have done their best to preserve the built environment that ranges from historic homesteads, mansions on what were large estates, uh, little sheds, wheat silos, the, the range is extensive. And I am just very fortunate to be in the position where I can be involved in helping to keep the stories of the area alive. Um, if we can move to the next, I know I said I'd put my hand up, but I forgot. Um, okay, so we have a photo here. This is John Street. And it's probably um, the second most used street in Camden other than Argyle Street, which is the main street of the shopping center and sort of runs at a right angle near where the little man is standing in the photo. And on the left in the photo, you can see a two-story building that sort of looks like a mini fortress. Okay, that is where the library is today. Um, the second floor that you can see there was removed not many years after this photo was taken. And if we move to the next one, Kelly, I'll just show, thank you. So you can see the front, the building on the right-hand side, that's Camden Library. You can see a two-story roof in the back. Um, that's the back part of the building and that houses Camden Museum, which is run by volunteers um, under the umbrella of Camden, Camden Historical Society. And um, on the left-hand side, we have our old fire station that was built in 1916. So, Around 2005, 2006, plans were made to do something about turning this area and these two buildings in particular into a historic precinct. So um, if we go to the next photo, you can see in 2007, a glassed area we call the Galleria was constructed to join the two buildings together. And the library remained on the right-hand side. The museum is still at the back. But on the left-hand side, we now have like a multi-purpose room where our historical society and our museum people quite often have functions or book launches. And they also use the um, gallery as space in the center for that as well. There's a quiet study area and entries to the family histories rooms and also to the um, museum at the rear of the building. And behind at the back of end of the fire station, I have two rooms where my collection is housed. So up until 2000, up until, sorry, 2007, we didn't have a dedicated area for our local studies and we didn't have a local studies librarian either. So um, when the Galleria was opened, Joe Oliver, who had been our children's librarian, took on the role of, and I think you might recognize her, some of you out there because she's also a well-known children's author. And she worked two days a week, Mondays and Tuesdays, and that is my hours. I work Mondays and Tuesdays, which can be a bit tricky sometimes to fit everything in. Um, but up until then, our local studies collection was basically some books that our and old newspapers that our reference librarian had kept aside, and they were stored on the end of the nonfiction part of the library. And we had a little shelf with stack area in the workroom. So it was not a very... Um, comprehensive collection. 
but from 2000 and onwards, 2007 onwards, everything started to move. And um, we now have in our local studies area, uh, one of the rooms has a controlled environment and that's where I store our old maps and our old newspapers. Most of our newspapers from the past, um, particularly the Camden News that ran from 1895 until 1982, have been put on microfilm. And most of that is also available on Trove. But we do have actual physical copies of nearly all of the newspapers, and they're stored in there, along with DVDs and um, recordings of our oral histories of local residents. That's an ongoing project. Some of those have been digitized and can be found through a link in our catalog um, under our heritage page. And we've also got um, a, a really interesting, from my point of view, it's really beneficial as well, um, agreement with our museum people, that is the historical society and our family history people, where we have a memorandum of understanding and we support each other's activities and our programs Normally in History Week, I would be coordinating a children's story time based around the theme from the ground up. And the kids would be um, given a tour, got guided by volunteers through the museum, allowed to dress up in some old clothes and hats and things. And also um, we have like ongoing competitions, um, school tours and things like that, that promote all of our facilities. So. Um, one of the things I wanted to say was that we're in the position because much of Camden, including the actual township or little village that was established there, were a result of generosity of the MacArthur family, particularly James and William, who were sons of John, um, and they donated land for various things like St John's Church. And coming up in a photo soon, you will see St. Paul's Catholic Church, which is our next door neighbour on the left hand side of the building. Um, the land for the Catholic Church came from there and Catholic school as well. So um, I'll just go to the next couple of photos. Yep. Of oh, that photo there, that is the house opposite where our library is called Macaria. And it was built originally by the MacArthur's to establish a school, but that didn't happen. And then the residence was bought by Dr. West. It's now belongs back to the council and we have an art gallery there that's part of our sort of historic precinct and it's called the Alan Baker Gallery because Alan Baker was one of our local painters of quite um, well-known repute. And um, it, it's sort of an example of the way that a lot of the old and very valuable, not just monetary value, but value to the history and the actual growth of the cultural identity of Camden are reflected by the way that buildings have been cherished and repurposed rather than knocked down and something else built in its spot. So from there, the next photo comes up and it should be the church I was talking about possibly. Oh no, that's Denby. Okay. So another thing that I wanted to mention our actual library um, area covers the whole of the Camden LGA. So that takes into account all of the new development around Leppington. Um, also infrastructure changes and the placement of motorways because of the new airport being built on one of our boundaries that just over in the Liverpool council area. And this house here, Denby, um, is part of an estate at Cobbety um, and it's not far from where the tunnel that's going to be built under Cobbety as a result of, accident, uh, of action from residents about having the M12 motorway go right smack through a couple of the historic estates there. Um, but what they've done is the central acreage around this historic house is going to be preserved and used and the, the gardens that cover five acres will be retained and maintained and then there will be subdivision of about 1,200 houses in the area covering the rest of the um, 1,000 acres that was the original property. Now, one of my challenges is going to be making sure that I can document all of these changes to infrastructure and the growth of the area and make sure that I've got records of it because what's happening today is going to change what 
people will be looking for in 10, 15 years' time when they want to come and have a look at our collection of the history of the area. And they'll say, well, what used to be there where that old house was? What, where all the houses are built? What was under it? And that's one of the ways that local studies librarians have to sort of keep up with times. Um, this sort of ties in with talking about, um, if we can go to the next photo, that's just, that's the Catholic church I was speaking about earlier. And you can see it looks like two buildings, but it was originally a little small church and it, the parishioners needed a bigger space. So they just added on and around it. And that's a sort of a typical example of the repurposing that we've got going on. And, and still the, um, the use of the buildings that have been there for 150, close to 200 years sometimes. So the next photo. Okay, so here we have our links to our heritage section of the library. Um, I must explain that it's a new website and we're still getting used to where things are. And there's a few things on here that are sort of what I call transient visitors because they're not going to stay there forever. And possibly they're not going to stay there for more than about a month. But when you look at these links, you'll see that we have one to our Camden Images. Camden Images is one of our collaborative um, projects that we have under our memorandum of understanding with our museum group of people, with the Historical Society. Um, as any person involved in a historical society or museum knows, you get lots and lots of donations. So we have our own specific collection development policy about what we accept. And we have a selection meeting um, for photos that will go on to Camden Images every couple of months. And we review whatever has been donated to the museum and also to my collection and also photos that I have taken. And I'd say probably about one in five or one in six photos goes up onto our Camden Images page. Um, it has close to 4,000 images on it, but that's nowhere near our complete collection. Now, the actual physical original copies of the photos are stored in the museum because they've got the space, I don't. But the digitizing aspect of it, the cataloging aspect of it, and also um, completing orders because we do have a service where people can purchase and order a, a print of one of our images. That's all taken place and the orders and things are all um, followed through in the library. I have a library assistant who helps me and she's full time, which is really good. Um, anyway, uh, that's one of the things that we have. But another interesting aspect of it is that if the photo belongs to the collection from the museum, a donation is sort of requested to cover the handling costs and things for them. So um, the other thing I want, I know I'm running out of time because I do talk too much, but I am also very passionate about what I'm doing. And I hope that there'll be lots of people out there who want to get involved and even just find out where they're from and why they got to the place they are and where they're going in the future. And you can do that through your local studies. But I wanted to just very, very quickly talk about what we're doing for the History Week, because as I said, we can't do our normal things. I can't have my photo exhibition that's normally on in the library. So that's now an exhibition online. So I had to write text to go with the photo. So that was quite an interesting thing to do from home, relying on the internet and materials I knew that I had on my desk at work but can't access. Um, so I just want to tell you, if you go to our website and our Facebook page, you'll find there's links to lots of things that we've got. Our Facebook page at the moment is heavily utilised because we have, um, well, for this week, we've got three different sessions of story time for the kids with a story that fits in with the from, from the ground up theme. Um, we've also, we run a quiz three times a week with a couple of history questions relating to the area. And a couple of times a week, I have an old photo posted and we sort of say, well, guess where this is? Can you pick the spot? So we're trying to be actively interacting with everybody in the community. Um, you just saw a flash of our new newest library that was opened in 2018 at Oran Park. I think there are plans as the area grows to open another two libraries. So I'm envisaging that um, I'll probably be retired by then. But in the meantime, I think I might be needing to be at work more than two days a week. So. Anyway, um, 
I just ask if anybody has any questions, but don't ask me too many technology ones. Oh, these are just photos of some of the growth of the new suburbs and that's going to be a leisure centre, that's going to be an industrial estate. So you can see we have to document everything we can get our hands on and I'm putting out um, to the public always, send me your photos, send me your stories, how's COVID affected you? Can you do an oral history with me about changes to your work? place and things like that and there's my ad for the history week to send me your photos so um that's about it but if you want to spend you. a couple of hours on the phone you can go ring me up and there you go thank you so much vicky um within the time you did it yeah well you were <laughs> waving to me <laughs> i was waving to you that was great um i think your love and your uh, dedication really shines through um, in the way you speak about your profession. You are a really experienced local historian with a lot of knowledge. Um, and I thought maybe as a first question, it would be interesting to talk us through the process of inquiries. How do you receive inquiries? What sort of questions? And what happens behind the scene when someone behind the scenes when someone asks you a question? What sort of resources? Um, referencing material do you have available if you can do that really quickly in a couple of minutes would be great okay well um if it's something I've never heard of I google it and check our catalog because it might be something very obscure and we do get some um interesting inquiries that are not particularly historically related trove is a godsend particularly for things that happened in event like events like an opening of a hospital or whatever in the past um, if it's something concerning a local family who maybe were business holders or that, and I know the name, but I don't have a lot of information, I will suggest to the person that it would be beneficial to also send an email to the family history people and the historical society. Um, sometimes I get questions that are a little bit out of our area from Wallandilly over the border at Wallandilly or Campbelltown. I have a really good relationship with um well we do my assistant is friends with somebody at Campbelltown so it's like a hotline if I'm stuck and I can say have you got this or have you got that blah 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 um but basically most of the questions I've got a fair good idea and I can go straight to when we're, when we're in the library go straight to the local studies rooms and usually find some information um quite often if it's more recent information I have relied a few times on looking at environmental impact studies because it'll be about a specific area where a new suburb's going to be created or a new shopping centre or maybe a train station. And the environmental impact study always has a really good, precise background history, including sometimes an archaeological dig for Aboriginal um, artefacts and things. Um, and I try and keep hold of any even though there's digital copies available from the council, I keep hold of any hard copies that have been just on display in our library because I know they're going to be useful. So is that, is that, um, I do get the questions via email, by in-person and phone calls. And if I'm not there, um, a lot of the staff can handle um, basic general inquiries if it's a bit tricky. People are usually quite good at waiting until the following one Monday when I'm back at work. Yeah. Thanks. It's good to remember and remind ourselves that you are only working two days a week and understaffing yeah. and being under-resourced is unfortunately a reality um, for a lot of people in the profession. Um, one last thing I found it really interesting when we were flicking through the photos, you said, I take a lot of photos. So you are obviously actively adding to your collection and yeah. building it and capturing that change that is happening so rapidly in Camden. I think you mentioned it's yeah. a growing area. In the in, yeah, yeah. Possibly in Australia, but definitely in New South Wales. I, check, I double checked that back before I said it. So, yeah, um, about once every two to three months, I will take a half day and go around with my camera. If I know there's a new high school being built, particularly around Gregory Hills, Oran Park, um, Catherine Field, uh, all around that area where there's a lot of growth and um, schools going up, I will sort of knock on the door of the site supervisor and say, oh, can I take a few photos? I'm from the library, give them my card. Um, sometimes they make me wear a, ha a hard hat. You know, um, I, often on the way into work, um, if I notice they're doing something new with 
around the side of the airport or on the northern road. I'll leave home earlier because I travel in through the back way at, through the end of Elizabeth Drive and I'll stop and take photos of things that have changed in the last few weeks. Like um, the Northern Road is a classic example. It's now like a beautiful motorway instead of being a windy, bumpy, very slow journey. I think it's 10 minutes quicker for me to get to work now. So, you know, um, and like my staff, not my staff, my colleagues are excellent. If something happens on the days when I'm not at work, we had an unfortunate experience with the historic Whiteman's Arcade a restaurant upstairs burnt down last September. And this um, particular shopping arcade had been built by a family who'd run a business in Camden for about 120 years. And all of a sudden the building, you know, it, it's still being restored, it's boarded up and everything. But I wasn't at work that day and I knew I'd get photos from the local newspaper and that, but um, some of the staff knew I'd need them. So they took the photos for me. So. You know, things like that. We work very cooperatively and I'm part of our programs team. Yeah. I, I programs. really yeah. Sorry to cut you off. We're gonna have That's to move right. to the next speaker. But I, I do um it really amazed me to hear how um often and how closely you collaborate with other groups of people that work in the history field in your local area. And that's obviously resulting in really positive outcomes for the community. Um so something for other local government areas to watch and learn from I think. Thank you again um, Vicky. We are going to move on to our last speaker just to stick to the time. So Kellyanne will now bring up Leanne Smith. As I said our last speaker of today and we're really excited that they were, able, they were able to join us. Leanne Smith is the director of the Whitlam Institute based in Parramatta. So slightly different from a local studies or local um, librarian, um, but we thought it'd be good to have them on board for today's presentation to really show the breadth and the depth and the variety of collections that we have available to us in Western Sydney. Um, Leanne. Leanne is an international human rights lawyer. She has worked in the Australian judicial system for the Australian Human Rights Commission in the international NGO sector regional human rights organizations and as an Australian diplomat in various roles for the UN. She is currently the executive director of the Whitlam Institute, which is within Western Sydney University and also an adjunct professor of law at Western Sydney Uni. Thank you so much, Leanne. Good to see you made it. Um, we're ready for your presentation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And hello, everybody. Um, it's lovely to be here, um, last speaker in this last session. So I hope you all have a chance to stand up and shake around uh, before we get into the last the last part of this panel. But uh, first of all, I wanted to say hi. I am um, calling in from Gadigal Wongal land, um, but the Whitlam Institute, which is homed in this beautiful building behind me, um, stands on the land of the Darug people of the Darug Nation. And I just wanted to pay my respects to elders past and present and really um, reaffirm the Whitlam Institute and staff's um, commitment to the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and we look forward to its full implementation. So the Whitlam Institute uh, was established by Gough Whitlam himself um, in uh, 20 years ago now, and he gave us a pretty clear mandate. Um, so in his words, he asked us to help the great and continuing work of building a more equal, open, tolerant and independent Australia. No mean feat, but um, also something really easy to get behind and believe in and work towards. Um, as you can see from the, the first slide that's on the screen at the moment, we do a lot of different things at the Whitlam Institute. And as you could probably tell from my bio, um, I'm not an archivist or a historian. I've done a lot of different things, um, but I find myself um, as custodian of the Whitlam Prime Ministerial Collection, this fantastic building, the Female Orphan School, and uh, soon to be another incredible um, asset that is an honour to, to behold. Um, so the work we do is um, around the Prime Ministerial Collection, which I'll speak more about. Um, we do a lot of work in the civics and citizenship education space through a writing competition called What Matters, that some of you may have heard of for primary and secondary school kids. 
Um, and we do policy research um, around two themes, the future of Australian democracy and Australia in the world. And then I suppose most of what I'm going to speak about today relates to the fourth area of our work around culture and heritage. Um, I've got a responsibility and a mandate to bring community into this fantastic heritage building behind me and to engage our communities in cultural, artistic, policy-based conversations and try and make sure that local perspectives are captured and included in national and international conversations about topics that mean a lot to all of us. So that's broadly um, who we are. Um, just while we're on this slide still, I just wanted to say that today in this very short period of time, I'm going to skate over the top of things rather than go into too much detail because I want to do three things. I want to tell you a bit about the Whitlam Prime Ministerial Collection. Um, I want to tell you a bit about the Female Orphan School behind me. And then finally, um, talk to you also about um, the Whitlam Heritage Home, which um, which has will be coming to the Whitlam Institute um, to take care of and be custodians of very soon. So thank you. If you could move me to the next slide. So the Whitlam Prime Ministerial Collection. Um, I'll, just before I tell you about it, I wanted to tell you what I've got on the screen here if you're looking at it. Um, the letter you can see there is dated the 2nd of June 1973 and it's from the Fairfield District Music Club uh, requesting Mrs Whitlam uh, to become their patron and advising of the dates of future musicals. Um, we also have a typed letter um, dated the 29th of June 1973 in response to this letter advising that Mrs Whitlam would be very happy to be patron of the club but would be unable to attend the 27th of July musical. Um, the second image you can see there is the uh, permanent collection, uh, the permanent exhibition rather of the Prime Ministerial Collection that is on the ground floor of our exhibition space in the Female Orphan School. Um, so we are based um, on the campus of Western Sydney University, the Parramatta South Campus in Rydalmere on Victoria Road. And um, the We've been in this building since 2013, and this is where we house the, the physical archive for the Whitlam Prime Ministerial Collection. The collection itself um, holds public and personal records, both um, relevant to Mr Whitlam's vision, his life and his leadership. So collected items have been donated by um, Goff and Margaret Whitlam themselves, the extended Whitlam family, Goff and Margaret's children and extended family, and also a range of individuals um, people who were former members of the government or, um, or the parliament or the party, um, family and friends, unions, individuals, um, Whitlamites, we call them, uh, and, and others. Um, and we welcome new donations of direct relevance to the Whitlam legacy um, that falls within our collection policy scope. Um, so... We have a part-time archivist uh, who works at the moment four days a week uh, to help us with the collection. At the moment, we've got about 20,000 items that have been described in the online collection. So that's described and digitised. Um, and that digitisation process has been happening over a long period of time, but we're also at the moment in a process of trying to um, re-digitise some items that are not as clear as we'd like them to be. So that's an ongoing process too. Um, the collection can be accessed online through the Whitlam Institute website, which is quite simply whitlam.org. Um, and if you look for the collection um, at the top of that page, whitlam.org, you can access. Um, it, it takes you from our own little web page, which we've designed ourselves, to a, through to a collections web page. <coughs> And there's a button on the collections web page called Search the Collection, um, which provides um, that link to the online search capacity. We use Rosetta, Rosetta as a tool for searching our online items. Um, and so through that online search mechanism in Rosetta, you can do a keyword search um, and it'll take you uh, directly to the digitized items. So, for example, if you if you typed into that search box Fairfield City Museum, um, you will get some results uh, that would include, for example, uh, an invitation for the 21st anniversary celebrations of the Fairfield City Museum, 
and Gallery that was held on the 2nd of May 2004, uh, which uh, Goff and Margaret Whitlam attended, together with several photographs uh, from that event that we have in the collection. Now, of course, under normal circumstances, um, the Female Orphan School is open to the public Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday every week. Um, and you would be able to have access Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday uh, to view the permanent exhibition that you can see in this slide here or the Margaret Whitlam Galleries. We have touring exhibitions running through the Margaret Whitlam Galleries on the other side of the Female Orphan School uh, regularly as well. And you can have on-site um, access to the collection for any member of the general public um, in our Gough Whitlam reading room, which is located just outside the archive. And you can have that um, direct access, physical access by contacting our archivist. Um, the Whitlam Institute has a general um, email inbox, info at whitlam.org. And you can also send inquiries there if you're interested in accessing any part of the collection that you can't find um, yourself online. Obviously, um, the building and the archive and the reading room uh, will be closed until further notice because of the, the COVID situation. But just before I go to the next slide, I also wanted to let you know that um, next year is the um, 50th anniversary of the election of the Whitlam government, as some of you may be aware. And um, we're running... Um, a range of commemorations for next year. But in order to build some stories around the 50th anniversary, we've um, created a special page on our website called What Does Whitlam Mean to You? And we're inviting people to um, share their stories or any paraphernalia, memorabilia they have um, from that period of history with us. And we're collecting those stories um, through a special form on the web page. So if you have um, stories about the Whitlam government or, or anything to do with the legacy of the Whitlam government, um, I'd invite you to have a look on our webpage um, and share, share your thoughts or experiences or submissions with us that way. If we go to the next slide, um, I wanted to share with you some information about the Female Orphan School if you haven't had a chance to visit it before. It's the oldest three. It's the oldest three-story building in Australia. It was built before Hyde Park Barracks um, by Governor uh, Macquarie and, and Elizabeth Macquarie. And um, rather than talking you through it now, I just thought I'd share um, a very short video that we recorded for the ABC Parramatta office um, just last year while we were open, um, so you can get a sense of the space and its history. So the, uh, we'll just share that now for a moment. I don't know if you have sound. I don't have sound. Right on your campus. Of... My name is Leanne Smith. I'm the director of the Whitlam Institute within Western Sydney University. And we are located in the Female Orphan School, which is on the right on your campus of Western Sydney University. Before the Orphan School was here, um, this was um, Darug land, the Darug people of Parramatta. And this building was built in 1813. So I think one of the the amazing things about this space that we're working in and bringing the community into now is that it was built in 1813 and that makes it the oldest three-storey building in the country. The building was built by um, Governor Macquarie and Elizabeth Macquarie um, who both had a big part of the design of the space and what it would be used for. So there's some suggestion that this building was design based on the Macquarie's family home in Scotland, um, which is a really beautiful um, and unusual piece of architecture for this part of Parramatta. Interestingly, the orphan bit was, was not entirely true. So I think it was only 20% of the girls who came here were actually orphans. Most of them had either one or two parents who might be living in extreme poverty or perhaps working jobs that meant that they couldn't take care of their kids. So they sent their girls here. And most of the girls who came here came on a voluntary basis. So as an institution, it wasn't a, um, an enforced time here. It was actually seen as an opportunity to come here and get an education and get away from downtown Sydney. Um, so the girls came by boat 
up the Parramatta River. Um, and that river is right out the front of the female Auckland school now. And you can imagine um, through each phase of history how that was the main artery from Sydney CBD to Parramatta. I suppose the next interesting phase of the building um, came a lot later in the 1880s until the, until the mid 1980s when this building was um, the Rydalmere Psychiatric Hospital. When we bring people on tours of the building, there are several elements we like to draw out for their attention. These wash basins and the shower recess, these were from the psychiatric hospital time. There's some amazing brickwork upstairs. One of the interesting things about the construction of this building for me is that Samuel Marsden insisted that the building not be constructed by convict labour. So it's one of the first buildings where it was built by paid workers. Um, so all of this brickwork um, reflects that. But one of the most interesting parts to me was the original fireplaces of this building were uh, converted. They were all tiled and had slabs of timber built into the fireplaces to use the toilets because there was no plumbing in the building. So it's really interesting. You know, we host these art exhibitions in these beautiful historic heritage spaces. And if you just look with any with a keen eye at any of the detail, you can really draw out some of the how hard and cold and, and difficult it must have been living in a building like this at that time with no no facilities or services. During the psychiatric hospital phase, the Royal Botanical Gardens provided over 400 trees and shrubs to create a, a, a kind of a healthy open space for the inmates um, to live in, but also to work in. So gardening was a big part of the therapy for people at that time. So the gardens, um, the jacaran trees um, outside still reflect the investment that was made by the state in creating um, a healthy welfare environment. After the psychiatric hospital closed, the building was derelict and um, there were some former inmates of the psych hospital who, would, who were squatting here. It was crumbling from the inside. It was really in a derelict state. And I think it was in 1993 that, the, that Western Sydney University approached the state government about purchasing the land, including the building, and made a commitment to restore the building to you know international best practice standards so that was a great opportunity and since 2013 uh, it's been the home of the Whitlam Institute so now this building is a space for public policy engagement uh, the building houses the 40,000 odd items of the Whitlam Prime Ministerial Collection this building is part of the Parramatta Heritage Partners Group that includes Elizabeth Farm and the Female Factory and a number of other institutions. And we're all part of putting together the jigsaw of the history of, of this part of, of the colony at the time, New South Wales and Australia. Thank you for helping me to share that video. I thought it might be nice for you to see some of, of what's inside the building um, at a time when we can't access the space and are very much missing being inside that, that valuable space. Um, look, I know we're short on time. So um, if we go to the next slide now, I just wanted to speak about um, the very, very exciting news that the Commonwealth Government is going to provide um, funding for the purchase and restoration of um, Gough Whitlam's family home in Cabramatta, which was, of course, mentioned in the quiz a bit earlier. Um, so it was a couple of months ago now that the Honourable Ben Morton MP, Assistant Minister to the Prime Minister and Cabinet, and made that announcement following a visit to to the home, which was purchased by a group of individuals who formed a company, the Whitland Heritage Home Trust, um, in order that the house um, be preserved for future generations. Um, so the Whitlam Institute is going to be entrusted with the custodianship with support from Western Sydney University um, behind us um, to both preserve the Whitlam Heritage Home for future generations, but also as Goff would have wanted, we think, um, enliven the space, make it part of the community and find ways to bring people into the space. Um, so we're looking now, um, we're, we're just waiting for that Commonwealth funding to finally come through um, for the restoration work to be underway. But it's our goal and our commitment to 
run through a series of community consultations with, um, with members of the Cabramatta community and Fairfield Council area about how people would like to see the space used, about how it can fit in with other community-based initiatives about the history of the area. Um, and to that end, we're going to be hosting um, some community consultations, probably online at this stage. We'd like to be it, it to be in person in, in Cabramatta, but probably online um, with the wonderful Christine Sykes, the author of, of Goff and Me. Um, and we're going to use her fantastic book um, and some of her memories from that time to start a conversation about what the home, the house um, has meant to the to people who lived in that neighbourhood, to the council area, um, to the commu broader communities of Western Sydney, and how we might make use of the home as we go forward. At this stage, we're really thinking about trying to make the, the home part, part historical museum with some elements from our own collection or previous exhibitions that we've toured, but also an active space. And we'd really like to see it um, enlivened as a multicultural civic engagement space if we can, but that's just our initial idea at this stage. Um, and I wanted to take this opportunity for everyone who's joining today to invite you to um, follow our website or join up to our newsletter so that um, we can share details about when that community consultation will be, but it'll be sometime in November. So in a couple of months from now. Um, I think that's probably enough from me and I'm happy to take any, any questions that anybody has or to welcome you to the Female Orphan School when we are all able to get back into the building. So thank you. Thank you so much, Leanne, for that talk. Um, I think, I hope that you have inspired a lot of people uh, to come and, and visit because it is a beautiful space, a very layered um, and sometimes difficult history that you're telling there, but um, really interesting and uh, worth a visit nonetheless. Um, you already mentioned the memoir, Goff and Me, which was one of the questions that I had um, prepared for you today. Um, Christine Sykes has written um, her memories of growing up as a neighbour to Goff Whitlam in, in Cabramatta. Um, and that sparked me to think about how your collection is changing from dealing with objects and materials that are relating to the actual time that Goff was in charge to mm. now making a transition to his legacy and to the impact that he has had and is still having on people's lives. Mm. What, sort of, what sort of stories have you seen coming through? What sort of memories do people share or are you hoping people will share? Yeah, um, look, I think this is exactly as Goff would have wanted it. So when he set up the the collection, he was really adamant that he didn't want the Whitlam Institute to be, um, in his words, a mausoleum. He really wanted um, it to be an active community engagement space. And, and as, you, as during his time as Prime Minister, contemporary relevance was everything to him. So demonstrating the contemporary relevance of some of those, those um, policy initiatives from 50 years ago still have a lot of resounding um, relevance to conversations today. And we notice that really so much when we work with young people um, in schools and, and, and young people at university. They're really attracted to the Whitlam legacy and they see so many ways it's important for the activism and the issues that they're interested in now. So for me, it's really easy to tie those two things together. And that's what breathes life into the legacy in lots of, in lots of ways too. So um, it's a pleasure to be able to draw out some of that relevance for young people who weren't alive at that time. You know, when, if you, if anybody comes to the, to the FOS to see the permanent exhibition, we have a guest book there for people to share comments. And I think the, probably the most common comment we get is from somebody who, who says how Gough Whitlam's policies around um, free access to tertiary education, for example, not only changed their lives as individuals or as women working mothers, but how it's changed the trajectory of their children's lives and their grandchildren's lives as well. So that legacy is certainly very um, deeply felt by people still to this day. Are you still um, involved in meeting regularly with the family as well? Are they a big part of the institute? They're a huge part of it. Um, and we've always had a Whitlam family member on the board of the, of the Institute. Um, so they're also um, 
they're also heavily involved in the planning we're doing for the 50th anniversary celebrations for next year. Right. I um, I'm gonna do one last question, which came from the audience, um, and is a question that I could have asked to any of the speakers today. But what challenges do you face in reaching an audience um, today, expecting digital access with a largely physical collection? Yeah, I think you know we are so much luckier than some of your other panelists who are doing doing this work on a volunteer basis. I mean. We work with volunteers to be able to be open to the public to show the building and the exhibitions, but we are lucky to have um, a trust and uh, funding from Western Sydney University. Um, our biggest challenge is um, archival staffing capacity. So um, obviously describing and then digitising items is, is a detailed process that takes a lot of time and with only um, one junior archivist on a part-time basis, we're not we're not able to digitize at the pace we would like. Um, but you know, everybody's working within difficult resource constraints and we can only do what we can do. And um, yeah, and hope that you know we win the lottery one day. <laughs> That's what my boss always says. <laughs> <laughs> Might, um, I might close it off um, on that note. Thank you so much, Leanne, for joining us today. Um, I hope everyone's listened to your um, talk and is going to be inspired to pay you a visit and to get involved in the community consultation um, that's going to happen around Goff's home, which is really exciting. Also for us, as the museum and gallery based in Fairfield, we'll definitely be, um, be speaking to you about that further. Um, and that's... Thank you. I'm just going to um, finish it off by thanking everyone for attending. Um, thank you to all our speakers. We hope that today's event has highlighted some of the great collections available to us in Southwest and Western Sydney. What is really showing through for me is the passion and dedication of those working and participating in history making. We live in a rapidly changing world um, because of COVID, because of the digital space, because of the rapidly changing buildings around us um, and it's a challenge to capture this change and to capture it while it's happening. Um, so we hope this event has inspired you to continue to participate in history, to reach out, connect and share resources, stories, collections um, and to get in touch. Um, and we're going to get in touch with you. At the end of this we'll send you an email with a survey form and also share the tips and tricks from today. So thank you so much again for joining and uh, happy History Week from Fairfield City Museum and Gallery. Thank you.